Steve Santa Cruzan, I guess that's the actual word. Uh, <laughs> we would uh, re reunite every year at the fungus fair. Uh, for those of you who've been around, uh, both he and I have been associated with the fungus fair for a very long time. I'm not sure, Chris, is it at least 20 years that you've been speaking at the Fungus Fair? Oh, it's more than that. I, I think it, it must have been the late 80s or it, yeah, or something like that. When did it start? What was the first years? Oh, the first year was in the early 70s. Yeah, that's what I thought. 74. Well, yeah. I came yeah, to Santa Cruz in 82, and I think I was, I think I was uh, participating in maybe 83, 84. Okay, yeah, I started in 79, so uh, been working on a fair of years. So anyway, uh, uh, take it away, Chris, uh, no, Dr. Christopher that. Hobbs. Oh, yes. you know, I was gonna t talk about next month before we, we get a talk, but- uh, Talk about him, his book. His, uh, uh, he's, he's a author. I should let her introduce, you know? <laughs> She's got all these ideas. He's so, a famous person. Right. Christopher, I assume you'll tell us about all your books and, and things like that. Well, I'm not going to go on about that too much. I'm only going to say, I'm only going to um, show my most current book here, which is, um, if I can get it, get this is kind of. Yeah, hold it <laughs> closer to your face because it's, you know, <laughs> there, it'll, there okay. got it. So I'll see if I can get it tilted right here. So it's called Christopher Hobbs's uh, Guide better look at it, Medicinal Mushrooms, The Essential Guide. And it is available for pre-order right now. You can get a pretty hefty discount if you pre-order it. It's going to be released in about four to five weeks. So, uh, and this, this really, they did such an amazing job on it. It's, I can show you maybe a few of the pictures here. It's just, it's just loaded with gorgeous pictures and it goes through uh, just all aspects of, of medicinal mushrooms, how to identify them, also some toxic ones, most of the toxic ones, a uh, big chapter on visionary mushrooms, psilocybin. And uh, the unique feature of it is that I, I review all the clinical trials that have been done on mushrooms, uh, including all the psilocybin tri trials for depression and anxiety and so forth. You've probably been reading about them in the news. And uh, reishi, uh, all the other medicinal species, turkey tails, I do review the clinical trials and summarize them so you can see how much scientific evidence is available for using these mushrooms for health and healing. And uh, it took me about a year and a half to write it, but it, it uh, is just a beautiful book. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. Chris, where do we pre-order that? Uh, pretty much everywhere. Amazon, uh, Kmart, or not Kmart, but but uh, Costco, wherever you go to go to buy books, there you can probably find it. So Barnes and Noble, wherever. And um, yeah, it's been delayed. It should have been out by now, but it's been delayed because of shipping problems from Asia. Uh, so now let me see, let me get on to my, uh, the main topic of the evening here, if I can at least find my uh, mouse here and, and uh, share my screen. Here it is. And uh, let me see, share screen. Uh, you have to tell me if it's working okay. Screen two. Okay, and why have I got that? Let me see if I need that. Oh. Um, can you see that? Yep. Okay, now I have to go to full screen. Can you see it? Is it okay? Looks good. Okay, now to get my pointer here. Laser pointer, okay, there we are. Can you see my pointer? Yep. yep. Okay, good. Excellent. Well, tonight I'm, I would, it's my pleasure and uh, thanks so much to Phil and, and uh, all the other uh, members for, um, for inviting me to speak with you tonight. And I'm always uh, just uh, totally excited to talk about mushrooms. 
and their healing qualities. Um, here's a picture of my new book, a closer up. Uh, and I want to mention that I sent an email to uh, Phil this evening uh, with a link to this uh, PowerPoint. So I, I do give some resources. There's some tables and charts you might be interested in. So if you want to um, review this uh, show at all, then it's, uh, he's got a link to it. And you can simply click the link and go to the PowerPoint and play the PowerPoint at your leisure. I'll go ahead and forward that to the Google group. Okay. Okay. You can even post it in the chat if you want to. If I okay. that. Yeah, yeah. If whoever's taking care of that, that would be nice. Um, so just to start out, uh, of course, I'm not saying anything new here. I'm speaking to the choir. Um, but a few things that I love about fungi and then I'm going to mention that uh, besides all these wonderful things of getting out in the forest and hunting mushrooms, all the wonderful feelings and sharing with, with friends, I didn't even put that in here, or maybe I did, but uh, I love, well, yeah, I did. Uh, I love going out with friends and I love going out alone uh, to get some forest bathing, but, and then cooking them, but there's, there's even more than that. So. That's why I put this up, but some of the things that I dearly love about hunting fungi or looking for fungi or loving fungi is wander, certainly wandering through the woods and getting forest bathing. Did you know that there are quite a few clinical trials now on the health benefits of forest bathing? So that just means going out in the woods, out in the forest and wandering in the forest and looking for mushrooms and, and you're gonna get healing uh, just from being out there in the forest. So, uh, and, and there are quite a few clinical trials even, I, I accessed them recently. So just being with friends or being outside, hearing the crows in the distance, splashing through the creeks with my great muck boots and the smells and the wind in the trees, the sound, looking under the duff for, for mushrooms. It's my son who started hunting mushrooms when he was very young, loved looking for uh, mushrooms and picking them up and looking, uh, looking under them and seeing if there are any mushrooms under there. So that's always fun. Uh, just seeing the swarms of turkey tail and sterium scattered on, fa on fallen logs, the, the shapes of the mushrooms, the colors, and then of course finding kings and queens and chanterelles and spring kakora. We had a big bloom up here in the Sierra of uh, spring kakora and spring porcini, which was just fantastic. Uh, and of course I found, uh, well, not of course, but I was fortunate enough to find some matsutake this fall up on the North coast. And then of cooking them so many different ways. And I'm going to present some recipes tonight. Uh, I'm sure you have your own favorite recipes, but it can't hurt to have a few more. And there's just so much more to, to hunting mushrooms and, and uh, eating them. And so I'm, first I'm going to talk about some of the really incredible health benefits of mushrooms. First of all, they're, they're not a high fat food. Uh, the, the, fat, the few fatty acids they have are actually healthful and important for our body's uh, nutrition. Not much cholesterol, uh, incredible mineral content, especially trace minerals, high in vitamins, especially B vitamins. Uh, Pleurotus and, and some other species are amazing protein sources, up to 30% or more protein, including all the amino acids. So that's, um, it, I mean, why so many cultures grow mushrooms? They are literally nearly a complete food and such a high protein source and minerals and other nutrition that uh, you can see why they're just so widely grown and cultivated in Indonesia, many other continents and countries. They're a great slimming food. And they, some can help really help regulate uh, cholesterol. As we get older, we wanna keep our cholesterol in good shape. So shiitake, pleurotus, oyster mushroom, those are wonderful at 
at uh, lowering cholesterol. And one of the most important things is they are very high in fiber. We all need more fiber and I'm going to go into that a little bit. I'm so keen on fiber and uh, as a practitioner, I'm a licensed acupuncturist, but I, and I've had a clinical practice for a long time. Uh, I, I tell people that probably the single best thing that you can do for your health, especially as we get older, for protecting your cardiovascular system, uh, your, 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 uh, your uh, you know, preventing diabetes, uh, keeping your insulin working properly, is just to get more fiber in your diet. So a few other things about mushrooms that, that are really good and they can convert a lot of waste waste materials, uh, biomass to protein very efficiently. Uh, again, uh, a lot of protein, but the protein is twice as digestible than most than can, that's found in most vegetables or even beans, up to 25% complete protein, up to 30 even. Also, uh, I'm, I'm going to recommend a book to you if you haven't read it already, and that's Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. If you're interested in the fascinating world of what's going on underneath the forest floor, uh, all the mycelium that is connecting the trees and helping with communication and the movement of resources. So the mycelium can actually move resources, sugars and other things, minerals around from tree to tree. When say one species of trees like a conifers uh, in certain times of the year, in the summer, when all the broad leaves are, have their leaves on and they're blocking the sunlight so the conifers may not be producing as much sugar, well then the, the, um, the broadleaf ones, the, the hardwoods are actually sharing the sugars they're producing with the conifers. And then when the winter, when the conifer, when the broad leaves have lost their leaves and they can't produce much sugar, the conifers share back the, uh, the uh, sugars. So, uh, and that's all happening through these mycelial networks. And that's what um, Merlin Sheldrake talks about in his book. It's just completely fascinating. It's a whole world and he goes into lots of stories, lots of characters, talks about um, uh, hunting morels and it's just a fascinating book. So that's, I would really recommend picking it up. And of course you can get it on um, Audible and, and uh, Merlin reads it, a very good reader. So mushrooms also have pretty high phenolic content, which are powerful antioxidants. So that's another reason to eat mushrooms regularly. Now the main medicinal substances are either triterpenes or beta-glucans. And beta-glucans are part of the cell walls of all fungi. They're interwoven with proteins and chitin and, and other, um, other polymers in the cell wall, which then protects the fun, fungi. And it allows them, it's so tough, it allows them to penetrate wood and penetrate the soil without any damage. So part of that uh, cell wall is, are the beta-glucans, which are uh, incredibly powerful immunomodulators. And I'm going to talk more about that coming up. Now, just to run through, some more specifics about what you're getting out of mushrooms. And here you're seeing uh, Pleurotus and Matsutake, Shiitake, uh, the button mushroom. And you're seeing here how much cellulose, hemicellulose, and the total dietary fiber that is in these. And this is, this is um, a really, these, these um, numbers here are really impressive. So this is a high concentration of fiber percent on a dry weight basis. So you're talking uh, some pleurotus are up to 50, almost 50% uh, dietary fiber. And again, we need a lot more dietary fiber. Just for comparison, if you're eating citrus, citrus or you're getting, you're eating beets, or here are some high sources of fiber down here, well, you can see that the mushrooms are higher than any of these typical dietary uh, fiber sources. And now I wanna talk a little bit about fiber and cardiovascular disease risk. We're all facing cardiovascular disease as we get older. It's the, still the leading cause of death. We wanna protect our cardiovascular system and mushrooms are one of the great best ways 
to do that as we get older. So, uh, you know, over 50, over 40, one of the best things we can do for our health, again, is to just get out in the woods, walk, exercise, and eat lots of mushrooms. So here's a meta-analysis that, that looked and reviewed 12 studies that met the criteria for their inclusion. And they, they had at least a three-year follow-up and they found a, um, a significantly lower risk of, of 9% was seen for both cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease for every additional seven grams per day of total fiber consumed. So that's almost 10% lower risk with every seven degrees of fiber consumed. And guess what has seven, what mushroom would have seven grams of fiber and that's three medium shiitakes. So if you ate three medium shiitakes regularly, you, could cons you, you might lower your risk of cardiovascular disease by almost 10%. That's not bad. And not only that, but we're just totally enjoying eating the mushrooms as well. Now here's a chart that's quite interesting. Here's the typical US diet, the amount of fiber that the, that the average American gets, which is about 18 grams of fiber. Here you're seeing it down here. Here's the percentage of, or grams of fiber per day, I'm sorry. Uh, so you've got, they're typically getting around 18 grams a day. Now, um, what the government, what our government recommends is getting 25 grams per day, but we can't even get to, most people are not getting the uh, recommended amount. And as you see, the more fiber that you get in your diet, the, the lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so if you get 45 grams of, of fiber in your diet, you're gonna get a 38% reduction of risk so that is incredibly significant, considering that most of us, especially as we get over 40 or 50, we're starting to have uh, a plaque in our arteries. We're starting to uh, develop uh, atherosclerosis, possibly uh, high hypertension and other issues with our cardiovascular system. Now, if you get a, a traditional diet, so if you were uh, out in a place like uh, East Finland, and I'm going to show you another chart in a minute. If you're in East Finland, they, they eat a traditional diet, a total traditional diet, and that includes a lot of mushrooms as well. They are going to get a 50% reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. So that is incredibly significant. And here is a, a, what, here's an example of how to reach 50 grams of fiber per day. Beans, lentils, split peas, kidney beans, so chili, all of these things is going to add 16 grams of fiber to your diet per day. Again, mushrooms. If you eat a serving of mushrooms daily, you're going to get, again, that, that high amount, maybe seven to 10 grams of fiber in your diet. Uh, whole grains gonna give you three grams. Uh, muesli or oats in the morning is going to give you like, oh, excuse me, oatmeal is six grams. A, a banana, three grams. Broccoli, almost four grams. Two to three cups of salad, uh, three grams. A cup of dark veggies, four grams. Nuts and seeds, three grams. A, a medium baked yam, four grams. And one apple or berries, four grams. So you can see it adds up. The more whole foods you're eating, the more fiber you get. Um, but you can pick and choose from this list to try to get your fiber up and it's going to not only help your uh, cardiovascular system, but it's gonna reduce your risk of diabetes, which is practically an epidemic in this country, and also your risk of cancer. Um, so, and, and another thing is I'm going to talk about how to make mushroom powders from medicinal mushrooms like turkey tail or reishi. You can actually get up to um, 50, uh, I say 50% soluble and insoluble fiber. You can get up to 50 grams uh, of, if you eat, uh, if you use these powders and add them to soups and so forth. And I'm gonna talk about how to do that. Um, 
So I might skip over some of these slides, but I want to mention that uh, these there are a number of ways that that uh, fiber can help protect your cardiovascular system, help reduce the uh, potential of diabetes, developing diabetes, and also cancer. There are a number of ways that they work. First of all, uh, the fibers can help prevent absorption of fats. They can also uh, prevent uh, and stabilize the blood sugar and, and the lipid lipids in, in the blood. So the more fiber you eat, the less uh, fi lipids, uh, and if, if we have a high fat diet, the less lipids are going to be absorbed and get into the blood. And also the blood glucose is gonna be stabilized and less sugar is going to be taken up. Also gel, uh, gels, you may know, if you've ever uh, blended up some shiitake even or turkey tail, and you get this gel that comes out of the fruiting bodies. Try taking some turkey tail fruiting bodies and put it into a blender with a little water, blend it up, and you'll see that you'll get all this gel. So there's all, this, uh, all these gels in the mushrooms, and, and that is actually filling you up and making you feel fuller and uh, triggering satiety. In other words, you're not, it, it reduces your hunger, and that's going to help prevent weight gain. Also the soluble fiber, there's a lot of soluble fiber, there's insoluble fiber in mushrooms like chitin and so forth, but there's also a lot of soluble fiber. Some of the beta glucans are soluble and there are some alpha glucans in there, non-starch alpha glucans. Those are all um, very water soluble and um, those uh, and also available to bacteria. And so the bacteria are going to ferment those and that is going to pr promote good bacteria in your gut, which has a lot of incredible benefits, such as modulating your immune system, strengthening your immune system, and providing short chain fatty acids, which are food for your endothelial cells in your gut. So it's gonna benefit your gut big time by eating more uh, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber, which you're gonna get out of mushrooms. Uh, also, there are many potentially beneficial compounds in mushrooms, such as anthocyanins, flavonoids, sterols, and so forth, which can reduce inflammation in your body and can act as uh, antioxidants, as you're seeing here. By the way, I do so cite my sources many times here. And if you want to look at, if you look at this PowerPoint again, and you want to look up this study for any reason, just go to Google Scholar and type in, in this case, uh, three Appleton or however you pronounce that, and 2013, and then just enter the, the, um, the subject, which in this case is going to be mushrooms and or fungi and cardiovascular disease or fiber, fiber and cardiovascular disease. And that study will come up and you can read it. Here is a chart that shows how much benefit you're going to get for preventing colorectal cancer. You may know that colorectal cancer is one of the leading cancers that uh, we have to deal with in our life uh, in the population. And so here's a chart showing countries, they, they studied all of these um, different populations, for instance, in East Finland, in Greece, Crete, uh, Slavonia, uh, in the US here, and uh, they studied all these populations for 25 years. And they, 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 um, they really took note of how much fiber these people were getting in their diet. And they found that uh, here you can see what they studied were you, uh, people that worked in the, on the railroad in the US. They studied all these people that worked in the railroad and here, here's the data point, UR, and it shows that their, di their baseline dietary fiber intake was uh, about 24 grams. Or, so that's, that's better than, than the average American, at least. But when you get up here to, here's Montenegro, here's Slavonia, here, but go on up to West Finland and Crete, and you're seeing that they're getting 50 oh, here, they're getting 44 um, grams of fiber in their diet. And so they're getting a 60% reduction 
uh, risk uh, for bowel cancer. That is incredibly significant. Traditional diet here in, 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 uh, in Greece, Corfu, which is an island in Greece, well known for their longevity. Some of the islands in Greece are some of the long, longest lived people on the planet. And you can see here that if, because they're eating a traditional diet, they're getting 58 grams of fiber and they're getting 120% reduction in cancer risk, bowel cancer risk. So I can't stress enough how powerful mushrooms are in adding the fiber to our diet. Now, um, here, here's a chart showing, this is actually from my book, showing different mushrooms, oyster, shiitake, maitake, cloud ear, which I dearly love to eat, enoki, chanterelle, porcini, and here you're seeing the amount of protein uh, that you can get from eating porcini, for instance, you're going to get around 30% protein in the cap of porcini. That is significant. So, you know, I, we love to eat porcini. If we eat, a, if we eat a nice big portion of porcini, we're going to get a significant amount of protein. I don't know whether you know it or not, but typically uh, as we age, we cannot digest protein as well as when we're younger. So um, it's recommended that we eat more protein over say 60 years of age. Uh, under 60 years of age, the amount of protein we should eat is about 50 to 70 grams. And it's thought that when we get over 60, because we can't digest it and absorb it as well, you probably have noticed if you're over 50 or 60 that we start losing muscle mass. So uh, whether, you know, even if we're doing the same amount of activity, we're going to lose some muscle mass because we're just not absorbing the protein that we need to build muscle. So uh, literally, uh, recomm the government recommends eating uh, about 70 to 80 grams per day of protein. I don't get that much. And um, I've used, I typically get around 50 to 60, I would guess. And I do, I, I'm very active, but even then I have lost some muscle mass, I'm sure. I just, I, I just happen to have a low protein uh, diet, but I try to get as much as I can. And I do eat sardines and take protein powder. Um, and I think that helps, but again, and, I, and the mushrooms that I consume regularly, which I, I have mushrooms, if not daily, at least three or four times per week. Uh, I'm eating porcini, I, I dry them. I'm eating certainly cloud ear. I'm eating maitake and lion's mane and shiitake. I'm getting all, an oyster. I'm getting all these, all these mushrooms in my diet regularly. So that's a major source of protein. Also, we're getting some essential fatty acids. Uh, we're getting, and here is the dietary fiber that you can see here. These mushrooms are incredibly high in dietary fiber, higher than almost any other food. Here's magnesium, uh, pretty high in magnesium, pretty high in iron. Mushrooms are, are very high in iron and copper uh, and, and, and they're off the charts in potassium. So uh, here is the um, essential amino acid index, the higher the the number, the more balanced it is and, and provides all of the uh, necessary amino acids. Here's the biological value, which means how easily can we assimilate the protein from the mushroom? And you're seeing here 80%, 92%. Uh, so mushrooms are, the protein is there, but it's also incredibly well assimilated. Um, here is, well, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip that one. Um, so the biological conversion is also like if you grow, uh, we were talking about growing mushrooms to begin with, if you grow pleurotus on rice straw, for instance, you're going to get 100% conversion. All of that rice straw is going to convert to protein. Uh, so mushrooms are very efficient. Some mushrooms are very efficient at converting um, substrate biomass to usable protein. Here is a little more on the mineral content. You're seeing here the phosphorus is off the charts, potassium, iron is an incredible source of iron, which we wouldn't think of really. Uh, zinc, very high, copper, very high. 
So um, you, you probably can tell that I'm pretty keen on adding mushrooms to my diet regularly, not only because I love eating them, but because I want to stay healthy. Uh, here's B vitamins. Mushrooms, again, are a very good B vitamin source. Niacin, riboflavin, pantothenic acid, folic acid. Look how high the folic acid is. It's an incredible source of folic acid and B vitamins, only second only to meat. And that's, that's so that's to let you know that these are really high in B vitamins. So let's talk about the uh, biological activity and the medicinal effects of mushrooms. Let's move on to that. All fungi in yeast have triple helix. That means the molecules are form form uh, helixes, 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 and they're also th three chains are wrapped around each other in the cell wall to provide a, a lot of um, flexibility to the cell wall and a lot of toughness to the cell wall. Now the, the beta glucans that are in the triple helix form are also bound strongly to a polymer called chitin. And chitin is in the same amino polymer, amino uh, gl glucan polymer that is found in crab shells. So as you probably are aware, crab shells uh, and arthropods have a very tough shell. Well, that's the same compound that's found in mushrooms that makes the, the cell wall very tough. And by the way, chitin is very unique to, to mushrooms and it, uh, it isn't in, in plants at all. And it also has immunologically stimulating activity. So one thing about mushrooms and accessing the medicinal qualities, they have to be heated, they have to be cooked. So um, I can, I can uh, say that there are many ways to cook mushrooms as you're aware. One of the best ways to cook mushrooms, if you want to capture the uh, break down the cell wall and capture the immunological activity is a pressure cooker. So you can break down even turkey tail or reishi fiber, you can break that down to usable food, if you will, even though you don't think of reishi as food, but you could actually cut up a reishi fruiting body, it's easier when it's fresh, put it into a pressure cooker, put it on a high, like an inst instant pot, cook it on high for maybe 15 minutes or a half an hour, let it cool down over another half hour or so, and it'll really break that fiber down and make it soluble so that we can add that to food and use it. And, and so again, some of these polypores are very, very high in, in, uh, in soluble and insoluble fiber and also immun immunological uh, activity. So these, um, these uh, beta-glucans and also chitin have a very complex immu um, immune activation in our body they target receptor sites like dectin, toll-like receptors, other receptors, and they start this amazing immune cascade that, that spreads out into our body. And by the way, these beta-glucans, even though they're fairly large molecules, they're taken up in the gut by macrophages, which then take them to all part of the body, even the bone marrow. So these, these beta-glucans can travel inside the body to the bone marrow, to tumor tissue, uh, to other organs and activate our immune responses. It's pretty remarkable. And so many uh, clinical, clinical studies and other types of studies worldwide have been performed on these beta-glucans. So they may act uh, singly, but, th but they work on a, in a variety of membrane receptors uh, they get monocytes going, which kill uh, um, uh, bacteria and viruses and so forth, macrophages, which, which integrate immune uh, responses and can also engulf uh, bacteria and other pathogens, dendritic cells, which kind of modulate and, and coordinate immune activities, natural killer cells, which can kill tumor tissue and also viruses, neutrophils, T cells, uh, which are really important for memory, for immune memory. And one, uh, one set of research that's coming out shows that when we're using medicinal mushrooms, it can enhance our T cells ability to remember 
pathogens like COVID. Uh, there are many studies now on COVID and how we gain long-term immunity from the COVID virus when we're exposed to it. We get long-term immunity because our T cells remember the spike protein and other proteins on the COVID uh, virus uh, particle. And uh, if we're using uh, medicinal mushrooms, that actually helps our body uh, and activates our T cells to, to go out there and interact with these virus particles and remember them so that uh, in six months or a year, uh, it is thought that this is one of our best long-term immune functions for responding to viruses, like even like the COVID, COVID virus. B cells are produce antibodies to the virus or to pathogens and uh, mushroom, using mushrooms regularly can also activate <clears throat> your B cells and also uh, stimulate your body to produce more B cells. So you're getting really quite an immune uh, response here that's much more complicated than you would think at first, first glance. Um, so here are some other ways as well, but, the, but let's move on to the next one. Now, how much beta-glucan are you getting when you eat wild mushrooms? That is a big question that we might ask. How much of this immune stimulation and benefit am I getting from the mushrooms that I'm eating? Well, here is a chart in my, this comes out of my book. Here's a chart showing the button mushroom, shiitake, oyster, chanterelle, honey mushroom, porcini, turkey tail, maitake, uh, and reishi, and wood ear. These are all mushrooms that I certainly use in my diet. And here is the amount that you're getting in, in the stalk and in the cap of the mushrooms. So you're seeing shiitake has almost about 20% beta-glucans. So that's a lot. Here's oyster, 24%. Chanterelle, 24% almost. Honey mushroom, uh, 33%. Uh, porcini, 17%. You can see that turkey tail and reishi have the highest levels of beta-glucan immune stimulating compounds in any of any mushroom. And that's probably why they were selected out since ancient times in China and other cultures to be used for health benefits, for promoting health, longevity, a good immune system protection against pathogens. They were chosen, turkey tail and reishi. Those are the two most important medicinal mushrooms uh, as far as how long they've been used in different cultures and also how they're used and sought out today and what products are out there in the marketplace. You'll see turkey tail and you'll see reishi and you'll see other ones too, like shiitake. But you can see very clearly that uh, wood ear, reishi, turkey tail, they're the highest in beta glucans. So they have the strongest immune activity. Here's a chart showing how they work. I don't think I'm gonna take the time. Now you can look at it again. It just shows here are the beta-glucan particles. They go inside the gut wall, the, the intestinal wall here. They, they are taken up by macrophages and by uh, these dendritic cells here. This tells you step-by-step step how they work. And, and then once, once these uh, um, macrophages and dendritic cells uh, engulf the beta-glucans, they're, they're uh, activated, they're broken down and activated, and then they're shed by these, these two types of immune cells. And that activates cytokines, which are pro-inflammatory uh, cell, immune cells. They activate CR3 cells, or sorry, natural killer cells, uh, granulocytes, and other types of immune cells like T helper cells. So this show kind of shows you, and then these cells attack tumor, tumor cells and tumor tissues. They attack, if we have a fungal infection, they would attack that and so forth. So this chart kind of shows you step-by-step step how these things actually work in our body. Here are the macrophages and granulocytes. Again, here are the beta-glucan particles. They're taken up, they're modified, they're engulfed, they're digested, and then you get beta-glucan fragments here, which are attached to granulocytes, these, these cells I talked about, and then those can target tumor cells directly here. 
pretty, pretty remarkable. So let's talk about what are, what are they used for? <laughs> Shiitake is often used for just weak immunity. And by the way, one of the most important um, points that I want to make tonight is that uh, when our immune system is, has been weakened by say we have a chronic infection, say uh, we, we uh, have a, a, even like chronic bronchitis or something, or a chronic tooth infection, something like that. Um, this really takes so much energy from our body because our immune system, if you can imagine how many immune cells are in our body trying to fight an infection, uh, like a viral infection even. Uh, if we have chronic hepatitis C, for instance, we have a chronic viral infection. Our body has to make all of these cells. They have to make, do all this signaling. They have, to go, they have to produce cells that can go after the virus and keep them in check, like herpes, for instance chronic herpes infection, which about 40% or to 50% of the population has. This takes a lot of energy. So it's really, if you feel fatigue, one of the ways to counteract that and to have more energy is to address any types of chronic infections that you might have and build up your immune system with, with um, medicinal mushrooms. So immune weakness, uh, treating infections, shiitake has been used for that also turkey tails. Shiitake and turkey tails are the two best studied mushrooms for uh, preventing cancer and also for treating cancer, along with chemo, um, chemo and radiation typically in the clinical trials. Viral syndromes, like if you have chronic hepatitis, herpes or HIV even, um, medicinal mushrooms are very uh, good for helping to support your immune response. Cordyceps has been used for many, many centuries for counteracting fatigue, for having higher performance as an adaptogen to help adapt to stress, <clears throat> and also as an anti-aging supplement. Rishi for insomnia, anxiety, nervous system disorders related to stress, and Rishi for respiratory tract problems. Now, um, in, in every culture more than, or considering all cultures that use mushrooms, about 270 species of mushrooms are, have been studied for their immunotherapeutic properties. In other words, they have beta-glucans, they have terpenes that can help, uh, help in our body fight disease and maintain health. 50 non-toxic mushroom species have have uh, yielded immunoceuticals in vitro. So in other words, they've been studied for beta-glucans or other active compounds that can activate our immune response. 50 species have research on them. And six species have been studied in human cancers. Here are the top cultivated mushrooms, and I'm going to talk about uh, how, uh, because this is going to be also the, the rest of the talk is going to be fo focused on cooking with mushrooms and how to use mushrooms for food and also get the health benefits and the immunological benefits. So here are some, are, I would say these are pretty much the, the top cultivated mushrooms that you can see. I don't know if you've been to Monterey Market uh, in in uh, Berkeley, uh, it, they have the best display really of edible mushrooms in, that are fresh of any place I've seen. And then there's also uh, Far West Fungi, which is uh, on, it has a stand in the Embarcadero and also the Berkeley Bowl. So those are places uh, though the first two really have the widest variety of cultivated mushrooms I've ever seen in a store, so, and it's a real treat to go there. Uh, so the button mushroom, shiitake, oyster mushroom, maitake, the clamshell mushroom, also called the brown beech, okay. or sh shimeji, shimeji, uh, either brown or white, king oyster, wood ear, muir, enoki, tea tree mushrooms, 
chicken leg mushrooms and straw mushrooms. So these are some of the most widely uh, cultivated medicine that mushrooms that have medicinal qualities, all of them. Uh, here are the, the ones that are most often cooked, I would say, that have strong Im immunological activity. Of course, the oyster, maitake, shiitake, the split gill is, we don't eat, we don't eat the split gill as much here in the US, Schizophyllum communi, but I will talk about it coming up and show you some pictures and recipes because split gill, we should be eating it more and growing it more. It really is a tasty mushroom. Uh, it's, it's very chewy uh, and delicious, I find, I, I eat it. And uh, it's widely used in, in Indonesia and throughout Asia as a food, as a favorite food in stir fries, in soups and other way, and loaves and so forth and provides a lot of protein uh, and a lot of immunological uh, benefits and anti-cancer benefits. Wood ear or any of the uh, any of these uh, similar mushrooms that I'm going to talk about. Also, witch's butter, uh, lion's mane, and and there are, there are more. So, what are the best ways to cook mushrooms for medicinal benefits? Probably many of you know all these and practice many of them. Uh, just, just to have it in one place here. Stir fries, those certainly are my favorite way of, uh, of easily cooking mushrooms. And soups, I do a lot of soups and stir fries. Uh, occasionally I grill, uh, especially really soggy mushrooms are good grilled, certainly. Um, and baking, baking mushrooms, I occasionally stuffing them and baking them. Cooking and blending. Now, cooking and blending is something that I do regularly, and I produce a mushroom powder. I'll show you how to do that. I've got a slide on it. And by the way, my website, ChristopherHobbs.com, you can get all kinds of handouts. You can get articles on medicinal mushrooms and, and more. Uh, and uh, you can also get a, um, a handout that tells how to, how to make the mushroom powder at home. My book has all of this, so you can also just pick up my book when it comes out. Uh, shish kebab, uh, sometimes I do that. Casseroles uh, and so forth. And any type of cooking that you're doing, soups or grilling st or st stir fry, you can make these water-based uh, extract powders of even reishi or shiitake or turkey tail, and you can add those uh, as, uh, as a secondary additive, some beautiful mushrooms. Let's start with a honey mushroom. Certainly one of my favorite edibles are the uh, honey mushroom, first of all, because they're so abundant. Uh, nowadays, uh, there, there's, uh, I'm sure you know the, uh, the story, there's so many more pickers nowadays. I remember Phil and I were talking about when we started back in the mid 80s, well, he started even earlier than that. But when I came to Santa Cruz in the earlier mid 80s, uh, you could go out there and you could pick porcini or, or, or uh, oyster mushrooms or whatever you wanted. And, and uh, you, there wasn't that much competition at that point, but increasingly there is a lot of con competition. And uh, now we've got, uh, now we've got Facebook, certain Facebook groups that show where to pick the mushrooms and how, and people are showing off their finds with, with trays of porcini and so forth. So there's just a lot more pressure out there on, on uh, wild mushrooms. And so honeys aren't as sought after, but they are quite delicious. Uh, they, yeah, they should be well cooked. They have a lot of beta glucans in them and fiber, and I think they can cause a digestive upset, upset in some people if you don't cook them well. But when they're in this stage here, uh, still young and, and uh, tender, boy, they are good. I find them to be quite delicious. And, and I, 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 don't, uh, I don't shun them at all. So here are some of the benefits of honey mushroom. 
They can help lower cholesterol. They have an anti-convulsant uh, activity that has been proven in trials in clinical studies. And it's widely used in China for people that have epilepsy and ticks and spasms and so forth in the body. They can help improve night vision. They can increase blood flow to the brain. That, that, that kind of sounds good, maybe, if it's not too much. <clears throat> to counteract uh, nerve weakness, neurasthenia, and supposedly benefits tinnitus. This is how it's used traditionally in China. Uh, and the dose is about six grams is a powdered extract, which again, I'm gonna show you how to make. Or you can make a tincture and you can use it. Um, some side effects, if you eat too much, just stick to the recommended dose and you shouldn't have any problems. There's <clears throat> some open trials in China. They show that it helps reduce hypertension and it benefits the nerves, helps strengthen the nerves. So they, so they do use the mushroom in, in medicines and you can, uh, doctors do prescribe it in China. Uh, and in vitro studies, it shows that they have antibacterial, antifungal properties, anti-tumor effects, can help stabilize or reduce heart rate if it's too fast, uh, can help move, help the blood move in the arteries, and increase coronary oxygen, oxygen efficiency, which is certainly good. Let's go on to the oyster mushroom groups. So here's, a, here's the delicate oyster which you can certainly find at Monterey Market or many other uh, markets that sell a variety of edible mushrooms. It's quite high in protein, up to at least 25% pro usable protein, low fat, low calorie, <clears throat> rich in fiber and minerals and essential fatty acids. So how can you go wrong? And they're also delicious. They have a fair amount of beta-glucans. Here's the king oyster. Pleurotus syringii, which is, uh, is definitely more firm. It's a native to the Mediterranean and regions of Europe in the Middle East, North Africa. And uh, some studies show that king oyster extract can, or just eating it actually, can help improve insulin sensitivity, can reduce total cholesterol, triglyceride levels, and increased HDL lipo. Pro, uh, proteins, which is pretty darn good, or HDL, the good lipoprotein in the body. Uh, here is the standard uh, oyster mushroom, Austriatus. Uh, it has an anti-hyperlipidemic effect, well known for that. It can, in one study they did, total cholesterol fell, fell by 33%, but that's, you have to eat quite a bit to get that effect, but it has a very powerful uh, cholesterol lowering effect. Also lowered LDL, which is excellent because that's the so-called bad type of cholesterol. Also tri uh, tr triglycerides can help lower triglycerides. Um, it has a compound in it, mavinolin, which is a very closely related molecule to lo lovastatin, which is, which is widely prescribed as a statin drug. However, it's much weaker. So you can eat lots of oyster mushrooms and you're, or you make a powder and you're go again going to get a good cholesterol lowering effect along with all the other benefits. And it's gonna lower the cholesterol by, because of the fiber and also because of this compound here, which interferes or slows uh, cholesterol biosynthesis also has an anti-tumor effect and uh, promotes uh, an immune activity na of, of natural killer cells. Clinical indications are definitely for cholesterol imbalances, two grams per kilogram per day. So you have to really make a, an extract and eat maybe an ounce of it a day. Uh, that's quite a bit of the powder, but still less amount can still give you some benefits lowers cancer, uh, colon cancer risk. Uh, so not many contraindications from oyster mushroom. Now here's maitake, certainly one of the most delicious mushrooms. And it's a pity that it doesn't grow, grow in the wild out here in the West, 
I've hunted maitake on the East Coast, as maybe a number of you have, and it's, it is glorious to find a big maitake on the bo bottom of a maple or beach or something. They are just amazing to find and delicious. Here are some of the, um, the benefits. Uh, again, it can help lower cholesterol. It can have a beneficial effect on hypertension, help prevent cancer, especially bladder cancer. There have been some studies, help, uh, help benefit the liver, uh, and also reduce your risk of non-insulin dependent diabetes and blood sugar imbalances. The, the therapeutic dose is about two grams of the, the mushroom powder three times daily. That's, a, that's quite a bit, but again, if you can make the powder, it's very convenient to take. And you can just eat the, the fruiting bodies and still get uh, some good benefits. Now let's move on to wood ear by Muir. You might recognize this, it doesn't grow in our area. I've never seen it anyway, but it is a fantastic fungi that is so highly revered in Asia, throughout Asia. And you might have, if you, uh, you'll see big, you'll see quite a bit on the shelf of uh, bags with these uh, interesting looking mushrooms. This is dried uh, by muir. It's, uh, you know, what you have to rehydrate it, obviously. So you put it into water and then it rehydrates and you can put it in soups. You can, you can cut it up and stir fry with it. It's, I love it. Uh, when I was in China, I, I lived in China for a while and I was studying um, acupuncture and Chinese medicine at a hospital. And I would always go into the local restaurant and ask for wood ear and also uh, by muir here. And uh, I would ask, uh, my teacher wrote out in Chinese, please add more wood ear because I loved it so much. So I would, I would eat soup, soups with it and stir fries and, and would get lots of wood ear. The different types of wood ear, they usually put in, they, they'll put in this a lot of time, the, the by muir, but also other ones, which I'll show you in a minute. So some of the beneficial effects are that it contains this interesting molecule, gluco, uh, glucoronoxalomannan. So it, a mannan is a sugar. So it's a type of sugar. So this is a sugar polymer. This is difficult to say here. Xylomannan. So it's a uh, glucorono xylomannan. And that was better. Um, but it's... Uh, it, uh, in China, they, it's been studied and found to have an anti-clotting action. So if you're prone to abnormal clotting, instead of taking warfarin, people actually in China make a regular diet of wood ear and they can actually get a beneficial effect of just opening up the, the blood vessels and the blood flows more freely. Also, it's, it's been studied in China for alleviating the side effects of radiotherapy uh, that's used in, in, can, in cancer. And it's widely used in anti-aging supplement and has over 40 Chinese patents citing it during the 1990s alone. So this is, this is uh, widely known throughout Asia and in Chinese culture as one of the cultural treasures, a mushroom cultural treasure that is widely used by almost everybody in their diet for the beneficial health effects and also just because they love the taste. Here is high muir, auricula auricula judy or auricula now uh, a new species have been, has been named in, China, in Asia, uh, auricula, which is found to be genetically different than, <clears throat> than other wood ears that we might have here. Uh, it's, uh, it's auricularia high muir, high muir. Uh, it's, if you go into Chinese markets, you'll see bags of these dried wood ears and one side is white like this and the other side is dark because of the trichomes or the hairs that are on 
the mushroom. Here's one that's a little older, kind of yellowish on one side, dark on the other side. And you'll see bags and bags and bags of these. So these are so, so widely used in China. Again, they're used to quell excessive menstrual flow and benefit hemorrhoids as a tea or just eating the food. Used as an iron tonic in China and to improve blood circulation again, to improve skin tone. Reduces, uh, if you make a salve out of it, boiling it up and blending it and mixing it uh, and making a cream or a salve, which the formula and, and instructions is in my book, uh, you can, it, they use it on externally for reducing skin pigmentation and also you can consume it and that helps as well. You have to be careful with it if you are on anticoagulants like warfarin. I would disclose it to your physician in that case. Now here is a traditional recipe. It's a lot of text. Again, you can get, I'll just mention some of the highlights. You can get uh, the, you can to copy it off of the web or you can probably find it or uh, you can just type in high moo air recipe or traditional recipe and I'll bet you can find it on the web. But also uh, it's on the, the PowerPoint. So, so you can look at it on, on Dropbox. So uh, in this recipe, they use a pork bone and, or spare ribs, or you could also use fish or I would use tofu because I don't eat meat particularly except sardines. So, uh, and then they add a hundred grams of dried high moo air, soak in warm water overnight. Then you cut up the carrots, you add some jujube dates, which are Chinese red dates, those are really sweet and really tasty. And they, they also strengthen your digestion and, and your um, ability to digest well. You throw in some figs, maybe some dried figs if you want to. You can add some uh, chestnuts in the winter time. Uh, all these things are optional. You can mix or match. <clears throat> and then you put it in two and a half liters of water. And uh, then uh, you, you cook it up. Uh, here are the exact instructions here. Uh, and then you boil for 15 minutes, skimming the surface if there's foam from the pork. Uh, reduced heat to low medium, cover the pot and simmer for two and a half hours. Yield about one liter of soup. And uh, it's, eating, eat, it's eaten as an anti-aging soup uh, and also can be walked after soaking overnight and cut into one inch square. So you could, high muir, you could either make a soup or again, a stir fry. And you cook it, uh, if you're making a stir fry, you cook it with bean paste, soy sauce, cornstarch, water, and an optional amount of sugar, or if you wanna add other vegetables. Here's the cloud ear fungus, another type of muir, which is auricularia nig nigricans, or it used to be called auricularia polytrica. Here it is here. Uh, I've seen it once in California. You don't see it very much, but uh, it's found in many other places. It was growing abundantly in South America. In England, I saw abundant quality quantities. In Europe, different places, it grows abundantly. It needs a lot of uh, needs a lot of rain. Uh, and here is uh, so it's been featured in Chinese cooking since the sixth century common era. Uh, so you soak the dried fungus at least 15 minutes before using. And the Chinese, in China, it's used to help balance cholesterol, improve, improve blood flow, again, and uh, some of the things that many of the other wood ears are used for. And I love the, the crunchy flavor, uh, the texture, and uh, not much flavor, a little flavor, but the, I love the texture in, in a soup or stir fry. Here is one of my favorite soups. It's black fungus, uh, or you can use any of the wood ears, cabbage soup, black fungus cabbage soup. Uh, use any type of moo air. I love this soup and I make it frequently. I, I add different vegetables. Sometimes I also chop kale very finely and add the kale in there if I want greens. It's a very simple and delicious recipe. Uh, so it, it only takes really about 15 minutes to cook if you use this recipe. So you chop the garlic or you can add onion. You can use one fish cape, 
opaque or or bonita flakes if you go into an asian store again like uh, ranch 99 or whatever it's called uh, then uh, you can get some bonito flakes and you just put the bonito flakes in there to get kind of a fish flavor uh, you can skip it if you want uh, and you can also put tofu in instead of the fish cake uh, and then the cabbage you cut you put in there maybe a quarter cabbage half cabbage cut it chop it up into the size you like add a handful of black fungus already soaked and washed uh, ha half a small bowl of chicken or pork stock chicken stock uh, or i use vegetable stock uh, but you can use chicken so stock there, there's this really um, boiled down vegetable uh, broth that you can get. You can put a tablespoon of that in. It tastes pretty strong. Uh, and then add your salt and other seasonings, whatever you like. And you braise for about 10 minutes, uh, the, the obviously like in the fish cake and cabbage and so forth, till it's tender. And, and then if you, depends, your timing has to be right. And the cabbage and black fungus can be thrown in for a short stir before you put in the chicken stock and so forth. And um, so just adjust your timing for how tender you like it. And, and then let it braise for 10 minutes. Let's say that up there covered and then add, add your salt at the end to, your, to the taste. And uh, so then you can make a very quick soup here and uh, a cabbage, cabbage and mushroom wood ear. And I, I love it. I cook it frequently. And I, I, um, I eat it maybe at least once or once every week or two. Now here's a salad that you can make from wood ear. It sounds maybe a little weird. I also eat this one. I like it quite a bit. So you soak your your mush your dried wood ears, and chop them up to your uh, favorite size. You can add edamame, uh, cilantro garlic if you want cloves of garlic very finely minced or onion. Uh, you can add chilies of various type depending on how hot you want it. Uh, I cook a lot, I mean I grow a lot of peppers and I have from frozen too, so I usually add peppers. Scallions, and then you add, toss it with rice vinegar, canola oil or olive oil, whatever type of oil you like, some soy sauce, and some, a half teaspoon of toasted sesame oil, and then just toss all that up. And that is really, you can see it looks quite good. Okay, the wood ear benefits, I uh, already talked about it, but here's some other ones. Moves the blood, stop. This is, comes right from traditional Chinese medicine. Moves the blood, stops pain, increases physical mental energy, slows excessive uterine bleeding, eases abdominal pain, uh, eases low back pain, uh, debility after childbirth, helps reduce muscle spasms, helps uh, counteract poor circulation. And also it's widely used for lungs and if you have a lot of phlegm, so it can clear phlegm and strengthen the lungs. So it sounds almost like a panacea, doesn't it? But these are all the things that, that is traditionally used for in China and frequently used, I would say. Here's witch's butter. I'm sure you've seen witch's butter out there in the woods. There are a couple different species around, around the Bay Area, Tremella orontia, uh, um, Mesenterica is up further north and in other places in the country, uh, Dacrymyces chrysospermus, that one typically grows on conifers, I've seen it, especially after a big rain, you see them just pop out on pines and so forth. These typically grow on oaks in our area. Um, sometimes you get do get massive fruitings after rains. I like them. I, I eat them raw. I tend to eat some of them raw, but I dry them and rehydrate and puts in, put in soups and stir fries. They are widely used. Uh, so it's a great food source. It has Lots of beta glucans in it, so it's immunomodulating. Cholesterol lowering benefits the lungs and, and helps soothe the lungs if you have an infection or something. Um, and it's well known that it can inhibit uh, Helicobacter pylori. 
uh, bacteria that resides in the stomach of most of us and has been associated with a higher risk of gastritis and stomach ulcers. So using it regularly, you can actually keep, uh, help balance this uh, could be pesky bacteria if it's overgrowing in your stomach. Uh, hypoglycemic effect can help lower blood sugar and again, activating immune response. So uh, here are some fungi that you might not think too much of. You might just pass them by, but give them a try. It's still not too late. I, I found some, uh, some of uh, both, both types of uh, witch's butter just uh, la this last week, I've been finding them. Shiitake, it's the fragrant mushroom. Very, very highly researched for anti-cancer, immune act activating, uh, cholesterol lowering, helps the body fight infection. <clears throat> and it's delicious any way you cook it. I have shiitake sometimes four or five times a week. I, I can't get enough shiitake, I love it. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course other species in there, but, uh, but I really uh, do love shiitake. Here are some of the biological effects, immunomodulating, anti-tumor, antiviral, protects your liver, reduces cholesterol, and helps prevent ulcers. Many, many clinical trials, I'm not really going to go into any of them. I'm only gonna summarize saying that there are numerous Chinese, Japanese clinical trials with a substance called lentitis, lentinus adotis mycelium extract, or LEM. This is just a crude extract of shiitake, high in beta-glucans, that has been used in clinical studies and in practice in Japan and in China for um, benefiting people with cancer that are on chemotherapy. It can increase the five-year survival rate, even up to 30% higher with people that are getting LEM over people that are just getting the placebo plus radiation. Uh, has an, a good anti-tumor effect, increases survival time again. Uh, and and this, it's been studied for inoperable gastric cancer and breast cancer. And this is another compound from shiitake called lentinin. So very widely revered in, of course, throughout Asia. Can benefit people with hepatitis C and B, uh, benefit your liver. Uh, cholesterol again, chronic fatigue, viral syndromes, immune suppression, infectious diseases. So just adding shiitake to your diet can really help benefit some of these issues. So here's the split gill. How's our time doing here? 8.30. Um, we have a little more time, I guess. Okay, you can talk. So split gill is a fascinating mushroom. Here you see uh, a plate of it, a platter of it. And it's widely cultivated in Southeast Asia and Asia. It's also a traditional food in Mexico. I've seen pretty massive fruitings of it in Santa Cruz. Uh, Davis, I've seen, strangely, uh, in Davis, I've seen really massive fruitings on alder. So, and, and I actually have seen it on alder in, in Santa Cruz as well. So look for it on dying or dead alders uh, in, in the Bay Area. Uh, and sometimes you do get very massive fruitings. Uh, it's pounded, they, they tend to pound it and tenderize it. Uh, so to make it uh, more tender and they can, you can add fish sauce to it or bonito flakes and a little water and pound it and tamari and just pound that up and then use it in stir fries or even soups. And it's very widely studied for, for medicine. Here is how you pick schizophyllum. This comes from someone that lives in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And they call it the tiny oyster mushroom. It's got, looks like gills on the bottom, but it's really not gills. Um, it's pseudo gills, I guess. Uh, I've got a really great picture of it in here, if I can quickly find it. Um, 
in my book that, that they put in here. That's really a great photo. Here it is. So you can see that it looks like gills, but it's actually uh, the, the, these ridges or pseudo gills split down the middle when the spores are, are um, when, the, when it's mature and then the spores are being shed, uh, you can actually uh, see where they're, where they're shed from that split. So that's why they're called schizophyllum or split, split gill. Um, so they call it the tiny oyster. So you, when you wake up in the morning after a big rain and you hand pick it and they call it jamur grigget. <coughs> jamur, jamur grigget. <clears throat> and so then you sun dry for later for later use. You rehydrate it overnight in the fridge, discard the debris and drain the mushrooms well. Then, or you can use the sulking liquid, which can be used to give it extra flavor. And you can make a vegan meal just by pounding the mushrooms until they are shredded to a fleshy meat texture and then mix them well with flour. And the dish is then called Kang Layan Pak Nam. And it's cooked in India and also Southeast Asia. Very famous dish. And here is another dish that you see here is the cooked split gills. By the way, you can buy, uh, you can buy the, the spawn if you wanna grow it. And you can also get flocks that will, that will sprout out with Schizophyllum communi. You can, I think uh, probably that uh, Far West Bungi has them. Mm. So, Jamur griget is considered a delicacy because it's got a meaty texture with earthy and pleasant aromas. Western cultures consider it inedible due to differing standards of taste rather than <laughs> known toxicity. Split gill mushroom, in fact, is, is edible and widely consumed in Mexico, India, Indonesia, and the, elsewhere in the tropics and also in China. So the rest of the world's eating it and, and we're kind of dissing it. We're kind of ignoring it. Hmm. Here it is being cultivated. And here's some split gill, split gill curry. If you wanna try some split gill curry, there it is. It's quite good. But boy, look at all that, look at all that split gill there. So you can see how, how just one of those uh, and, and you can grow them. I, sh I show how to grow in poly tubes, how to inoculate, uh, how to prepare the, the uh, substrate, the straw or wood or chips or whatever. I, I show you how to do that step-by-step step in my book and how to, and just inoculate it with your split gill uh, spawn and you can grow your own. Here is a, a loaf called Kong Leyen Pak Nam. It's pan roasted split gill mushroom loaf. And it's, uh, you, so you, you pound the, the uh, split gill and you mix it, you mix it with vegetables and maybe even other mushrooms if you want. Uh, and with herbs with a variety of different herbs, you can use any herbs you like. Uh, and then it's served on banana leaves or turmeric leaves, which are you know, wide and kind of aromatic the turmeric certainly is. And it's a dish that's widely eaten when people are young during childhood. And with this, you can also use other mushrooms. Here is a link to, to the original recipe and the instructions and, and video. Here is the uh, ingredient, here are the ingredients. A half cup of dried split gill mushroom, shrimp, chives, onion, mm. uh, fermented fish, chilies, turmeric, turmeric leaves, and salt to taste. So uh, ginger, so you're seeing how to, how to, uh, what ingredients are. And then if you wanna make the loaf, then you can, you can go to this link here and they'll show you how to make it. Um, so here's some more, it's, it's some medicinal effects. They use it in Malaysia and the Philippines for counteracting seizure disorders. It has anti-tumor. It restores natural killer cell activity. Mm -hmm. uh, re, uh, it increases our resistance to bacterial infection. 
and they use it, it shows protection against chemotherapy. Um, it's also a great source of this compound called beta bisabolol, which is also found in chamomile. And it it's used externally in cosmetics and it's absorbed through the dermis. So you can make a cream or a salve out of, out of split gill and you can use it on your skin to help heal wounds and to help reduce inflammation of a rash and so forth. It also has a strong antifungal activity uh, and, and has an anti-inflammatory activity. So pretty interesting. And they do use it as a paste uh, for, for skin, as a skin preparation in Southeast Asia. Here are some trials, uh, better five-year survival rates with stage two cervical cancer when given with uh, radiation. And clinical indications, guests, and pretty much a repeat. So let's go on to lion's mane. Lion's mane is certainly one of the most sought after mushrooms right now, I would say. You don't see them that commonly, but typically every season I find a, a beautiful lion's mane. Uh, I know certain areas where they grow. Uh, they certainly are beautiful. They are incredibly tasty if you've eaten them. You can buy them small ones that are cultivated at a Chopper's Corner in Santa Cruz, but in other places. Uh, it's, being, it's getting a lot of attention right now because there are some clinical trials showing that it has memory enhancing effects, it has compounds which are called diterpenes that have memory enhancing effects that can be used as a nerve tonic to activate nerve growth and repair. And there's a small study that shows mood enhancing effects. And also it's incredibly delicious. So um, here are some other things that it's been studied for. It's been shown to have antibiotic, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, anti-fatigue, hypertensive, hypolipidemic, senescence, so against aging, cardioprotective, hepatoprotective, nephroprotective. Yes. Uh, you know, also stimulates nerve growth factor to help regenerate nerves. And that's why it's gathering so much attention right now. And there are also clinical trials on mood disorders, which I show you in the next slide. And it's very, it uh, can, can help with cognitive function and depression. Uh, it, yeah. This mushroom is literally one, likely the, the most popular mushroom in all of Asia. You find it everywhere. Go into any Chinese market and you will see shelf after shelf of bags full of cultivated lion's mane dried uh, fruiting bodies. And they soak it and then they cook with it. Soups, stir fries, whatever. Uh, and they eat it frequently. Like it's almost like a daily thing that they eat to get the protein, to get the immune effects, to get the anti-inflammatory effects the nerve benefiting effects, the mood, mood regulating effects. That's probably why it is so incredibly popular throughout Asia. And again, you see it in every market. So for nerve repair, uh, it's only, so far it's only in vivo and studies in human cell lines, but they have, they have pointed, they have shown that it can stimulate the growth and repair of, of nerve cells. Here is an excellent review article if you want to read it. There are two clinical trials. Uh, one 50 to 80 year old men with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, uh, they studied again, 30 people for 16 weeks. The dose was one gram a day of powdered fruiting body. They found that cognitive function increased significantly over placebo using a standard measurement scale. They also, there's another study that showed reduction of depression and anxiety in a randomized double blind placebo control study with 30 women with depression and anxiety. They found that it was helpful. Uh, Virum group, in other words, the group getting the, the lion's mane versus uh, uh, say uh, placebo had significantly better store, scores and here is the article. Here are the best non-edibles to cook, so-called non-edibles, certainly turkey tails, 
because they are so high in beta glucans. So you, what you wanna do is you wanna freeze them for three, after picking, and you, you know, some years you just get so many fruiting bodies, but the, the, always leave some, don't pick them all. Always leave some, like half, leave half. You're seeing a big log full of them. They're easy to pull off, pull them down and get the fruiting bodies off, but always leave half um, to, so that they can keep doing their job, recycling the carbon in the forest. Um, so you freeze the, car, the spore carps for two to three days, because if you don't, if you dry them, they're just gonna be sawed, they're gonna be powder within a month or so. Try to put them in a jar and store them because of the fly eggs that are in there that will hatch out and they'll eat up your, <clears throat> your mushroom. Uh, so then simmer to make a broth. So you just boil, simmer, 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 or you can put it in a pressure cooker and just simmer it. Uh, if you simmer it all up, you can either just uh, filter out the broth, the, mus the mushroom flavored broth that has beta glucans in it, or even more powerful, you can, once you cook it and maybe put it in a, a pressure cooker for again, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, let it cool down. Then let, the, let it cool down a little bit and then put it in your blender and blend it up until it's creamy, until you blend it up all of that cooked mushroom or turkey tail and it's really a nice tasting uh, thick broth that it makes. It's a little gelat, you know, some gel in there and you're getting all of those incredible beta glucans. And then you go ahead and you make soups with that or you can go ahead and dry it in a food dehydrator and make a dried powder that you can add to soups or, or stir fries or whatever. Or, or you can make a drink out of it and it make it an instant tea. So you could either discard the mark, the, the cooked portion, or you can blend it up. I much prefer, and I recommend blending it up because you're gonna get so much more out of it. The artist conch, uh, make, make, uh, make and make tea as a coffee substitute, dark and strong after you, um, the, the artist conch is, a, is another mushroom. It's again, it's Ganoderma, brownie eye or aplanatum. Uh, if you cut it up when it's, when it's uh, tender and, and fresh, then you can you can boil it, uh, either dry it or boil it, and and just uh, make a, a kind of a mushroom coffee out of it. It's dark and strong and bitter, and it has immunomodulating effects. I don't know if you've ever consumed or, or thought about getting a, an artist conch and cutting it up and let drying it and then boiling it to make a strong coffee-like drink, but you can, and it's not that bad tasting. It's quite bitter. Uh, here's the medicinal mushroom soup that I often make. This is, the, this is my most common recipe. <clears throat> um, first, I, I do, there's two parts to it. First of all, you, you, you put stuff in the Instapot. If you want a bean soup, a be bean medicinal mushroom soup like lentils, first you put the lentils in and you put the turkey tails in, for instance. You, put plenty of water in there, like half an instant pot. You put the top on, put it on high, uh, turn it on for 30 minutes until the mushroom is broken down and the lentils will com be completely broken down. Uh, then you go ahead and, and do a stir fry. Um, you can put all your vegetables and everything else, onions and whatever, right in the instant pot and then make your soup that way and seasoning. It works, but if you want more flavor, more rich flavor, then I do a stir fry and I put in onions, sliced onions and peppers and tomatoes if I have them and garlic. And, and, and I've oftentimes put in finely chopped kale. Uh, you can put asparagus in there as you're seeing here. You can also, if, you're, if you grow bean sprouts, you can put bean sprouts in there. And then you go ahead and stir fry those. But when you're stir frying them, put the lid on, put maybe some water in there, like a quarter cup of water, put the lid on, put the oil in there, say a tablespoon of olive oil, and you kind of stir fry and steam them at the same time until they're tender. So I, I lift the top off and move it around, put my spices in there. Like I often use uh, curry spices. Uh, I often use paprika, I like a lot, and chilies. Uh, so those are the two that I use a lot. And then put the top back on. When it's all tender and done, 
you just go ahead and just pour that right into your soup, your instant pot that has the broken down lentils or beans and the turkey tails. And, and then you're just going to heat it up basically and let it sit for half hour and it's done. And that makes an absolutely delicious soup that has so much uh, potential health healing benefits uh, that, that uh, I, I make it frequently. I make it usually once a week and I, I freeze some and I eat on it uh, sometimes for, for a couple of days. And, and uh, this is a, really one of the mainstays of my diet. And I modify it depending on what vegetables are. You can also put squash, pieces of cutting, cut up squash like kabocha squash or, or any other type of squash. Oftentimes I'll slice up yams and, core, and cube the yams and put the yams in uh, and, and cook those a little bit till they're tender. So there's different ways that you can do it, but this is the basic, this is my basic turkey tail medicinal mushroom soup, you might say. Here it is here with some moor in it, maybe some greens in there. This gives more details. Again, what I was, but I pretty much mentioned how to do it. And now um, cordyceps. Cord cordyceps is not something that you're gonna think of eating, I'm sure. In China and Asia, many people do eat cordyceps mushrooms though. It's a caterpillar, the, the moon, uh, moon moth caterpillar, ghost moth caterpillar. And then the fungus attacks it and consumes the mycelium, consume the caterpillar, and then produces these fruiting bodies here that look, look like a club coming out of the top of the caterpillar's head, and they're dried. These things are more valuable than gold now. They are incredibly valuable because they're a cultural treasure in Tibet and China. And they're not that common, and they have to be, they have to be handpicked one by one in the Tibetan highlands, up high up in the mountains, whole families look for them. And so they're incredibly valuable uh, and very costly. Because of that, and because they haven't been able to figure out very well how to uh, cultivate these uh, wild cordyceps that are so widely re revered for sexual, increasing sexual potency, uh, counteracting fatigue, uh, increasing uh, by your vitality, performance, and like if you're doing sports, it's thought to be, you know, a superfood basically for energy and sexual vitality. That's why it is so highly revered. Uh, be but because it's so expensive and because many Westerners do not like the idea of eating caterpillars, now we have a, an option. We have Cordyceps militaris, which does grow on caterpillars uh, insect uh, larvae, and here it is here. It grows in the southeastern United States. You can find it, uh, but it also can be cultivated. So it's widely cultivated on brown, cooked brown rice. And if you grow it just right, and you put the, just the right additives in there, not insects, you can get it to produce thick amount of, of um, fruiting bodies. I don't have a I should have a, a picture here, but you, you can make, you can grow masses of fruiting bodies. So here are the fruiting bodies that, that you can buy and you can add the soups or stir fries or whatever. And they're very tasty actually. Uh, or you can make the mushroom powder that I talked about. Uh, so cordyceps militaris. So if you want to try cordyceps, never buy a product that says cordyceps on it. And you look on the back and it says cordyceps or the newer name, Ophiocordyceps sinensis. Don't buy those products because they are not Ophiocordyceps sinensis. They are some other species. What you wanna buy is a Cordyceps product. It might say Cordyceps on the front, but on the back, it's gonna say Cordyceps militaris. Then you know that it is at least what it says it is. I've done a lot of research on this. So I'm not gonna go into great detail here, uh, here, this is basically just what I was saying. You'll see other species such as Cordy Max or CS4. Now, sometimes you'll pick up a bottle of Cordyceps and it'll say CS4 on it. 
that is a strain that is widely cultivated and widely used. And especially for protecting the kidneys, Cordyceps CS4 has actual clinical trials showing that it helps protect the kidneys. So if you're, if you're taking a medication, if you're, you have kidney problems, uh, this, is the, this is the supplement for you is Cordymax or a Cordyceps CS4 because there are clinical trials showing that it helps protect your kidneys. Um, here are some other clinical indications. Again, people that are recovering from illness, anti-aging effect, immunosuppression. It's very well known for counteracting asthma and bronchial and lung inflammation uh, as an adjuvant for treating cancer, but the other ones are better for that. Turkey tail reese is better than for that. But here, here is nephr nephritis, nephrotoxicity. Uh, it has clinical trials uh, and nephrotoxicity in elderly patients that are on certain types of meds are very hard on the kidneys. So here's Cordyceps linguini. If you wanna be daring and you wanna try some Cordyceps militaris, which you can buy them in packets, maybe dried. And, and you, I think you can probably buy them from far west fungi. So two ounces of fresh Cordyceps militaris or soaked, three ounces of dried high quality linguini or other pasta, one tablespoon toasted bed, bread crumbs for the top, two tablespoons extra virgin olive oil for finishing a large sh a shallot cut in half, then julienne, sliced chives, maybe some dry white wine, kosher salt and pepper to taste, a good handful of fresh watercress trimmed into one to two inch pieces and some dried pepper flakes optional to taste. So this is a recipe that is quite delicious. If you want to try some Cordyceps Militaris uh, with pasta. And here is where the recipe came and you can check it out, foragerchef.com. Now making the dry, a few more slides and then we're finished for questions if you have any. Making a dry tea extract, <clears throat> you put the mushrooms like turkey tails, reishi, you boil them in a pot with plenty of water until you reduce the water down to like literally one tenth of what you started with. So you're gonna cook the mushrooms well, uh, or if you use a pressure cooker, you just break down the mushrooms like turkey tails or reishi, whatever, other mushrooms can be used too. Uh, you just break them down in a pressure cooker uh, and then you're going to, to um, either strain but, and reduce the tea down even more until it's really thick, or you're going to uh, leave the mark in there. So you're, gonna, you're just gonna take, like we did, I told you before, you take the turkey tails that have been well cooked with just a little water left after boiling it down, you put it in your blender, you blend it all up, uh, and then you go ahead and uh, it should be pretty thick at that point. And then you go ahead and you pour in, pour onto your fruit leather trays of a food dehydrator. Here it is right here. So you go ahead and you pour it into your fruit leather trays, then you dehydrate it and get a wafer. It's gonna be a kind of a solid wafer. It's basically mushroom leather. Then you're gonna take that once it's dried and make a powder out of it. Put this, store the powder in an airtight jar and then you can pour that you can take a tablespoon or a teaspoon at a time, put it into soups, uh, put it, sprinkle it into a stir fry uh, to use it. And it's going to, or even make an instant tea by putting one half teaspoon into a cup of hot water and drinking it. You can add other herbs like ginger or licorice to make it taste better. This is going to give you a real immune boost because it has all those beta glucans of the reishi or of the turkey tail. And again, on my, my book, I, I de completely detail how to make it and show pictures step by step. Um, now, if you buy a, a mushroom product, say you want to buy a lion's mane product in capsules, there are a number of brands that you can get. If you go into uh, the, your local health food market and uh, you'll see these beautiful pictures of 
Lion's Mane or whatever, and you buy a bottle of, of capsules. Well, what's in those capsules? It is going to be mainly, oftentimes, I'm not saying completely, but many times it's going to be mostly starch because what they do, the growers do is they take brown rice and cook it, pack it into poly bags, inoculate it with a mycelium, say, say lion's mane. They're gonna let the mycelium grow out and eat some of the brown rice, but not all. They only give it a few weeks, maybe a month. So it's not completely digested. Then they take, they harvest the block, they dry it and powder it and put it into the capsules. So the problem with that is, you know, you might be getting some fruiting bodies in there because if you, you let the mycelium grow on the cooked brown rice long enough, it's gonna start producing fruiting bodies. Yes, you can grow fruiting bodies on brown cooked brown rice, but you have to really let it go for a long time. And not every, co not every company does that. So how can you tell uh, whether your product has got starch in it or not? Or glycogen, which is basically what uh, mushrooms do with starch. They digest it, gobble it up, and then they store it because they need glycogen for quick energy when they fruit. But glycogen is not hardly at all immunoactive and starch is not, not um, immunoactive at all. You're not getting any benefit out of starch uh, for, for what you're buying. So what you do is you get a bottle of iodine solution. You can easily get it on Amazon or wherever, your local pharmacy. You put, um, you put a couple capsules of, of the powder in a glass of water, you stir it. It's gonna be lightly amber like this. And you go ahead and you put uh, a dropper full of the iodine solution in there. Now, this is a standard starch test. If it's got starch in it, it's gonna turn bright blue. If it's got glycogen in it, which means that the, the mushroom mycelium had a lot of starch to consume, it consumed it all and stored it as glycogen. So this is maybe slightly better than if it's just blue like this. But frankly, if it's blue and it stays blue, your product has got a significant amount of starch, could be up to 80% starch, likely 30 to 80% starch. And if you pay $30 a bottle, then it's not worth it. So there are some companies that sell bags of mycelium um, powder, which are a lot better. And one company is Mushroom Harvest. That's one company that I know I act as a consultant for them that I trust and I know are, have fruiting bodies in there and they let the mycelium uh, consume the rice so that you don't get these high levels of starch. So thanks for watching. I'll see if there's any questions, but check my website out, which is ChristopherHobbs.com. And again, this slideshow can be viewed, viewed here. And if, if Bill can uh, text everybody or get, get the link out, then you can watch it again. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it when we, we stop here. Okay, well, I'm done for now. That's all for the presentation, but I'll take any questions if you have them. Got to be a few. Dustin? No. Nothing? Holy spitballs. No way. I, I have a question. I have a question. Oh, Barbara. Yeah. Um, you mentioned to use a pressure cooker. Would it just be all right to cook longer? Yeah. On a pot? Yeah, you don't need you don't need a pressure cooker. You can just boil them for an hour or two and you just simmer it down. You start with a say two thirds of a pot of water, put the sheet, uh, turkey tails in there, cut them up a bit if you want. Uh, it's actually maybe a little, doesn't matter. And then just start cooking, cooking, cooking until it's reduced down to about one tenth of the original volume, then let it cool a little bit and then blend it up until- Then blend it in a blender. Blend it in a blender. Okay. And then the other thing, um, 
when when I'm reconstituting dried shiitakes, for example, or whatever, um, bolit, um, I just stick them in water and put them in the microwave. Am I destroying anything or is that okay? That's okay. Um, yes, the, the beta glucans are very sturdy. They're okay. very, uh, you're, you're not gonna break those down very much. Okay. Uh, you, probably a little bit, but it doesn't matter. The pieces are also active. The, 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 the phenolics, the terpenes, those are all pretty stable compounds. Great. You, you might, if you, you know, when we're cooking them real high heat, you could lose some of the B vitamins, uh, but otherwise the other compounds are really going to be pretty, pretty solid. Okay. And then a lot of times when I've had dried mushrooms for a long time um, in pieces, I'll just grind them up in the coffee grinder and throw them into broth or soup or anything. Is, is that okay? Or should yeah, I be sure. cooking? Sure. I mean, uh, they, they have to be cooked to soften them up to gain access to the active compounds and the nu nutrition, but, uh -huh. and also make prevent uh, any, any irritation in the gut. That's why we don't eat raw mushrooms as much, but, but yeah, if you're, they're powdered form, like in a coffee grinder, I do the same thing. Oh, just good. Put, put some mushrooms in there when they're dry and powder them up and, and, uh, and just add it to soups. Sure. That works yeah. fine. Yeah. I just keep it in a shaker by the oven. It's yeah, very handy <laughs> and it's so, so good. good. <laughs> yum, yum. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Okay, that means I did a good job of explaining everything, I guess. Yeah. Well. So, all right. Well, my Thanks pleasure so again much. to be with you and um, hope we meet on the mushroom trail out there somewhere. Absolutely. Definitely. Christopher, we'll, we'll be back to you. Okay. All right. Good all to right. see you, Phil, as always. A absolutely. Okay. Okay, have a good evening. Yeah. All right, you awesome. as well. Thank Great you. Job. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Email yeah. the thing too. I will. Yeah. Mm. Leave. How did I do that? Leave. Oh, they clear out pretty quick. Yep, they're clearing off for me. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>